Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this week's NFL football preview card. And with us are experts at hand, as always, Andy Isco, joining us from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. Jim Feist, the legend himself, also from Las Vegas. Victor King from the Playbook Totals tip sheet is with us in the house, and so too is Andy, or Tony Mejia, I should say. He's the contributing author to the Sporting News and also a resident playbook expert. And last but not least, our producer, Greg DePalma, will be joining us on the show once again today. And we've got a really good show on tap for you guys today. We're going to tear down the NFC, both divisions, the NFC East and North divisions. And we're going to also wrap it up at the very end with a little bit of an extra whipped cream on the cake. We're going to break down the top 100 <laughs> NFL football players that were just released last week. And our opinions on those, we will share those with you. With that, let's introduce the gang, if we may. Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com. How is everything for you in Las Vegas these days? Mark, everything is wonderful. I love Mark, I mentioned, I think, last week about the passing of the legendary Dave Koken, and we had a, locally, we had a, a tribute to him over this past weekend, which was extremely well attended, swapping a lot of stories. Some I knew, some I didn't know, some I knew that were somewhat embellished but they were all very good and it was just a, a nice tribute and testimony to uh, his life, his career, and uh, what will be his legacy as a genu genuinely well-liked uh, uh, person almost universally throughout the, the industry and the city of Las Vegas. So that was uh, one of the highlights of the weekend. And then of course, uh, getting to see the first full weekend of uh, preseason football and listening to all the overreactions for the good, the bad, and the uh, irrelevant. Well, Jim, I know you weren't able to attend Dave's uh, ceremony or celebration, I should say, and I know you really want to be there. You're going to be there this weekend. You were hunkered down in my hometown in Cleveland, Ohio, where a tornado kept you under wraps while you were visiting Cleveland. Uh, what's your thoughts about the celebration that you'll be attending this weekend? Well, it's, uh, they had a, pu a, a public one when I was gone. I wish I could have been there, but I was, like you said, I was hunkered down hiding from the tornado <laughs> do you ever have one when you live there a tornado oh. uh, no, victor do you everybody... recall one I, I don't oh yeah know. yeah a couple on the far east side absolutely it's uh, scary there. it is yeah oh, it was scary <laughs> it was scary <laughs> <laughs> um yeah well the uh, i will be there uh thursday uh here in las vegas they're having a, a private one um i guess for the people that i i don't know the people Dave knew a lot of people. I mean, obviously, like hundreds of people showed up for the public one, and it's. Uh, it, I'm looking forward to it. Dave was a good guy. Yes, Dave was a real good guy. Uh, Andy, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Victor. You didn't know uh, Dave Koken. I know you knew of him. Uh, what of the things that you learned about Dave Koken? What was it, maybe, perhaps that might have impressed you the most? Uh, just his uh, relationships, relationships with customers. Uh, relationships with fellow people here in the uh, our particular industry and the fact that I, I don't think there's ever a negative word said about the guy so uh, just the love amongst the people in this handicapping industry for Dave was just unparalleled and Tony me I know you have a lot of Vegas connections yourself as well have you ever or did you ever cross paths with Dave Koken yeah, fortunately, uh, uh, like I, I tweeted out when I heard of his past, you, Tony. And even beforehand. Is, he, is, is Tony he, not mute? No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear him. Okay. I'm not going to be able to hear him then. Just keep that yeah, in mind. I, I, I am fine. Just keep in mind. As I was saying. Hear him. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I got a chance to interact with him uh, when I went over and joined the Wager Talk family. Uh, and, and now I'm, I'm doing stuff for Sports Memo. So uh, I was fortunate to see. Uh, Prez and his uh, tribute and, and whatnot when uh, when Dave unfortunately passed, but even even beforehand when he did the uh, his Twitter announcement that you know, he, had, he made the decision that he wasn't going to uh, undergo any treatments or whatnot, just going to let nature take its course. Um, while sad, completely, uh, you know what I had learned about him uh, kind of fit that style that he was going to do things his way, and I got to interact with him a lot. Uh, before shows we used to do baseball shows on wage talk tv uh and whatnot so oh i mean welcome me with open arms when i went from vegas insider to wage talk that was really special to me it meant a lot uh coming from him uh and then just you tip the hat in terms of respect for the guy i mean he he was able to do that this when it was 
hush hush and not as uh, embraced as it is now uh and uh just the reputation that he builds up uh both by knowing his his stuff and by uh, treating people uh, the way that anybody would want to be treated. So, uh, you know, a, a tremendous loss for the industry. You, know, you mentioned the hat. That's probably what he's most likely <laughs> endear, endeared to the most, the hat that Dave Koken almost always wore, uh, at least uh, publicly. The hat and the voice. And the voice, yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, guys, totally. you know, we had this uh, issue last week. I just realized this. And that's, since I can't hear him or see him, I don't want to go through this show thinking it's possible nobody else heard him or see him. That wouldn't be fair to Tony. So, Tony, why don't you shut down and come right back? All right, sure. I will. I will log back in. No All big right. deal. And then go ahead and re- re- ask that question again for Tony. I know it would be repetitive for you, but I'm not. I don't think anybody else heard that. Okay. So I just want to make we, sure we heard it. Yeah. We well, heard I, it. Last I, week. I heard it. Last yeah. week when you heard Jim, it did not go over the air because I didn't hear him. Oh. So I have to hear him, and I and I couldn't hear him. Just the okay, way so the setup th- is. One one thing about one thing about Dave was I, I hope I'm sure somebody said it at the at the get, gathering the other day. He was a unique guy. He did things his way. Uh, very he didn't he, when he had it on his mind he said it. That's, he was he was right out front. Yeah, he had very, an opinion. Very, yes. Very very very. It was genuine, mentioned that that he stood hard with his convictions and he didn't mind he did not mind uh, vociferously disagreeing when he thought he was on the right side, but he never did it in a condescending way. Tony Mejia, uh, we're talking, as you know. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. By the way, just so you know, uh, my only interaction with Dave when I was, uh, I had uh, covers as a sponsor, and they were, this is how I think we met, Mark. Yes, Uh, it is. And uh, and Dave uh, was one of the, uh, was one of the handicappers that they recommended I speak to, and he was always great. I mean, it was really nice talking to him, and I knew that he, you know, he had a busy schedule, and uh, it just seemed like he was the type of guy that it didn't matter how busy his schedule is, he'd accommodate you. He also he also had many interests outside of sports, and we mentioned, of course, last week the pet, the uh, animal adoptions, especially his his favorite cats. Also, very big, uh, very big into movies, especially old time movies. All right, we're set up with Tony. Okay, and with that, we're going to welcome Tony Mejia back into the show. Tony, as you know, we're talking about Dave Koken. I know you have a lot of Vegas connections. Uh, you've been associated with a lot of people in Las Vegas. What was it like when you crossed paths with Dave Koken? Oh, just total pro. Uh, um, like, like I mentioned earlier, I don't know if, if anybody heard me, but uh, when I went from Vegas Insider to, to Wager Talk, he was obviously well established there welcomed me with open arms and that that was real important to me because i had uh you know no, known of him uh at vegas insider i think a lot of us were there uh you know with with picks and that that was my gig for for most of the last decade and so right before the pandemic or right after it gets hazy uh but i, I switched over to wager talk and, and started working with them and so did a lot of shows with Dave, baseball shows college football shows college basketball shows so we would always chit chat beforehand uh, you know, man, a few words because we're always busy, but in terms of uh, just knowing his stuff and always being ready and, and, and being a pro and treating people the right way, I think that's what sticks with you most is that he, he did this before a lot of us came along uh, and uh, and was able to be, you know, one of the uh, one of the shoulders that we stand on in terms of setting a reputation that that is worthwhile, not screwing people. I think that's important for every one of us that, that wants to do this and, and lend our expertise because obviously um, you know, there's a lot of charlatans out there, uh, and he was not one of them. So, uh, you know, it was a, a tremendous loss for the industry, like I mentioned. And, uh, and, un- and fortunately for him, I think it was you know, uh, terrible to have to deal with cancer, but I think he dealt with it his way. Uh, and mm-hmm. in that sense, uh, you know, peace, the peace had to, had to uh, live within him from that standpoint. Well, Jim, I, as you mentioned, you're going to be at his private celebration this weekend and uh, i wish and hope that you pass along our deepest sympathies to uh, dave coke and the family and whatnot and uh he was on a member of your television show your widely popular television show seen on usa network all across the country mm. uh tell us a little bit about what it was like working with dave Coken on camera <laughs> well he, he like tony said he he was a pro dave and i worked together almost 40 years 
Uh, wow. I met Dave, Dave in the late 80s, and um, he, he was always prepared. He knew his stuff. Uh, he said what was on his mind. He disagreed with you or, agree, you know, we agree with you. It was always fun. We became good friends, and I'm proud to say we were good friends. Um, when he moved, when I, I, I ran the business for a long time, and then I, I downsized, and everybody went their own separate ways. But we we made friends. We had lunch occasionally with Scott and others, and and uh, it was fun. We we had a good run, you know, four decades almost, and that's pretty damn good. Better than most relationships. And uh, Dave Dave was a good guy. He was a good a good guy. He was an honest guy. We had great conversations about a lot of different things. And he was like we are, my wife and I, animal lovers. And he loved his cats, and we love our dogs. And and he always said, dogs, you, humans don't deserve them. <laughs> They're too good right. for us. <laughs> he always yep. said that. And um, <laughs> he had cats. He would have dogs, but he, the way, where he lived and stuff, it was difficult to have that because they, they command, demand a lot more attention and care. Cats kind of take care of themselves a lot. So uh, he, um, he had a good life, and he did it his way, and... I think all of us probably should follow a little bit of that instead of trying to make everybody happy and doing what they want you to do. He did it his way and he did it right. And he was a lot of integrity, honesty, loyalty, all the things you look for in somebody. And Dave and I did a lot of radio shows together and on top of Proline. Proline was on, on 36 years. And uh, wow. Dave was there most of the time, most of that. Uh, it was a hell of a run, actually, and um, and then he he always did a lot of radio. And Andy, you know, locally here, and you were involved in a lot of that too. Um, he was always on the air, and that's I think he he probably picked up a lot of local fans because of that, because he was he was the voice of sports in Las Vegas for years. I don't know how many years, but it was a long time. Well, I remember getting started with him uh, with Lee Pete way back in the day. So we're oh, talking yeah. mid to late, mid to late eighties. And, you know, this was a time where there weren't very many shows. In fact, the Stardust line on, uh, I think it started Saturdays and went Saturdays and Sundays. And then they added a Friday show it was basically the only gambling uh, specific show that we had on the airwaves and radio for uh, many, many years. Uh, Larry Grossman came along with a show called You Can Bet On It, which went a little bit beyond sports betting, including casino games that uh, started, I think, in the early 1990s. And for many years and, of course, you know, the younger listeners and viewers have to remember this is all before uh, not off, not just offshore wagering. It was before the Internet came around. So uh, oh, yeah. it was a good time to be in involved and a lot of us uh, learned uh, learned from Dave and uh, enjoyed our time with him. You mentioned that Andy brings back memories because when I hosted the uh, Mark Lawrence against the spread radio and television shows, uh, the radio show would come on before the Stardust show. So we were like the lead in to the Stardust show and uh, you know I thought, wow, that's really a nice little setup they gave me here a lead in to the Stardust line. That's really really good. I uh, believe I believe uh, Don Wagner from Allegations Analysis had the 8 to 9 Pacific hour. Your show had the 9 to 10 hour. And then Stardust Line was 10 to midnight. Yeah, that was a pretty good evening of football information, I'm, mm -hmm. to say the least. All right, guys, let's get into our show this week. Uh, we're going to preview, break down, as we've been doing here, the National Football League divisions. This division, this the two divisions we're going to go to this week are the NFC East and the NFC North. And it's being brought to you, as always, by the 2024 Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. And they're still flying off the shelves right now. And the supplies are getting deeply, deeply limited. 254 pages of everything you'll need to know for this football season contained all between the pages in the Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. Check it out at playbooksports.com now to pick up your copy before the season begins. And with that, let's get into the NFC East. And I'll kick things off. Uh, we're going to talk about, namely here, the teams that we think will win the division and the most disappointing teams inside the division. And I'm going to kick things off uh, and go right to the team that I think will win the division in the NFC East. And my vote is being cast for, and I think we're going to hear a little bit or a lot of this, is the Philadelphia Eagles this football season. Uh, a couple of reasons that I like the Eagles. Uh, number one, uh, deeply disappointed off that really, really fine start to the season they had last year, 10-1, and one, and they closed out the season 1-6. And, and 
to me, as a handicapper, I have to believe that that Super Bowl loser jinx really bit them in the end when it really, really counted. Uh, and they failed sort of miserably down the stretch of this football season here. Now, this year, they're going to start the season in Brazil in week number one. And they're only going to play one home game during the first five weeks of the season. And the reason I'm mentioning that is uh, only five of their remaining 12 games are against teams that were playoff opponents last year. So if they can withstand this first five-game barrage, the Philadelphia Eagles, I would be surprised if they don't win this particular division. The team I think will be the most disappointing is the team that won the division last year, the Dallas Cowboys. And for openers, we're going to use that against them because no team has repeated in the NFC East in 20 years. I don't see Dallas doing that this particular football season. I think the team's got problems, and it starts right at the management and the ownership level with this Dallas Cowboy football team. Uh, they are going to play only 10 teams are going to play this year, a total of three games in 10 days. The reason I'm calling this out is Dallas is one of those 10 teams that will play three games in 10 days. That had never happened in the last 20 years, but for whatever reason, for the schedule that we got this year, and this schedule is whacked out uh, for all the scheduling nuances that they put together, three games in 10 days, and the Dallas Cowboys will be part of that. With that, I'm going to turn over to Victor King from King Creole Sports. And Victor, what's your take on the NFC East this year? I don't have much to add to what you just said, Mark. Uh, definitely uh, my team that within the division is the same, the Philadelphia Eagles and most disappointing team, Dallas as well. You know, Philly in the offseason, and last year was a season that despite their 11-6 and six straight up record, they actually allowed more yards per game than they accumulated on offense. The stats should correct slightly here in 2024 with Kellen Moore in place as their offensive coordinator with Vic Fangio moving from South Florida to Philadelphia as their defensive coordinator. Uh, Dallas, what do they do in the off season? The Cowboys, they, uh, they address virtually no needs whatsoever. Only one offensive skill position player in the draft. One of the weakest running back rooms in the entire league. Bad depth at the wide receiver position. They've got looming holdouts with Dak and, of course, CeeDee Lamb, both trying to uh, get some more money here to grab the bag in the offseason, if you will. I would not be surprised if Dallas actually finishes in third place. Because this Washington team, for me, it's got some eerie similarities to the Houston Texas Texan team of last season. We're talking about Washington, the Commanders, uh, totally cleaning house in the offseason, brand new owner. Like Houston, a new GM. Uh, like Houston, a new uh, head coach. Like Houston, drafted a rookie quarterback that is a dual threat quarterback in Jane Daniels who looked very, very good in his first game. Again, the similarities to Houston are striking, and I would not be surprised if Washington actually eclipsed Dallas for second place in the NFC East. But I'm with you, Mark. Dallas disappoints. Philadelphia, with a chip on their shoulder, wins the division. He has the ability for sure. Yeah. Yes. All right. And with that, uh, let's move it on over. Tony Mejia, how do you see this NFC North shaking out this football season? I see this being a, a really bad division. Simple as that. And a lot, a lot of these teams are going to struggle, but one has to win it. So uh, it, it, will it be Dallas? Will it be Philly? I'll, I'll ride with Philly. That's fine. But just to speak about what these, what challenges these teams are going to face right out of the gate. I think that there is a, a real realistic scenario where Washington's the only one that wins week one. And that would be, um, you know, a, an upset for them. They're playing at Tampa Bay. I could see them winning that game. I could see the, uh, the New York tabloids after, the, the, you know, the Monday morning after uh, Sunday's games, lauding Sam Darnold, who comes in from, uh, from Minnesota to play the Giants. 
Giants already having some misfortune with injuries. And then you've got the Cowboys and Browns. I spoke on earlier shows how that's the week one game that I'm most looking forward to. And you've got the Eagles uh, playing the Packers in Brazil, and that's going to be a, a Friday night game, I believe. So from, from that standpoint, you've got the Eagles. We've already talked about their demise last season where they faded late. And now you have a situation where it very much looks like uh, Jalen Hurts and, and Sirianni don't get along. We'll see if, with Kellen Moore there uh, if that alleviates the situation, if there's pressure immediately. Uh, they've obviously got Saquon Barkley to work in now. But the, the tush push, which was a huge part of their success last year, is going to be completely different because while you have Jalen Hurts there, you no longer have Jason Kelsey. And if you no longer have Jason Kelsey, uh, and then they, they lost big key parts to that offensive line in, in previous years with Jason Peters uh, falling off a lot and then ultimately winding up in, in Dallas. Um, now you have uh, uh, Matthews being um, a, a part of uh, their you know top uh, offensive lineman, but at, at this point, still not being somebody that you can completely rely on uh, from an injury standpoint. And then you've got just those worries that they start off slow and there's some infighting there. And then Dallas, they'll get C.D. Lamb in by week one. I think you already reported this week, but pressure on them immediately uh, to, to perform. So, yeah, I mean, I think if Jaden Daniels hits the ground running, because I do think Washington is a little better than the Giants at this point, uh, Washington's got a chance to be the surprise team in this division. Uh, Jim Feist, let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you in a different way. Uh, is there a team in the NFC East that you think could win the Super Bowl this year? And is there a team in the NFC East that you wouldn't even consider? Well, I wouldn't consider the Giants. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're, they're, they're pretty badly um, structured. I, I, I don't have any belief in their quarterback. Uh, Dable did well when he was in Buffalo, but he struggled a little bit and he kind of lost uh, his temper a few times. But I, I think he's got that under control. At least he says he did. He feels like he has it under control. The issue with Philadelphia, um, I don't know what's hap what happened to them at the end of the year, but it looked to me and a lot of other people as well that they didn't even want to play. I mean, they like you said, they won at six down the stretch after 10 and one. And, and it, was, it was a horrible performance at the end of the year. And Sariana, Sariani, he, he was successful two years prior, but he had an offensive and defensive coordinator that helped out a lot, and they left. And, and then they took off 10-1, and one and you thought, oh, man, that's, that's pretty damn good. And now they've changed again. Offensive and defensive coordinators are, are changing again. So Sirianni, a lot of people thought he should have been fired after what happened last year and how he, he just didn't perform at the end of the year. And I kind of felt that way. So I don't know how good he really is um, because those two coordinators he had two years ago were very good. And so we're going to see what happens here. Uh, new offensive coordinator, Kellen Moore. Hurts. Okay. Is he as good as he was two years ago, or is he going to look more like he did at the end of, of last year? I too picked Philadelphia to win this division down on Dallas, like all of you are. Uh, Jerry Jones is definitely not a guy I'd want running my team, although I'd like to have his bankroll. Everybody <laughs> else would, too. <laughs> and um, still, I guess it's still the most expensive franchise in the NFL. Dallas is America's team. But, um, no, I, don't, I, I think that Washington, as you said, has the ingredients. Offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, head coach, new quarterback, their offensive line play is going to have to step up. They've got some players. Uh, new ownership seems willing to spend money and, and build. A lot of good things. Like Victor said, they, they could be the Texans of last year. That's a long shot to do that because what the Texans did was put pretty damn remarkable. So it would be hard to, hard to say that, but that, they have the elements right there. Well, I'd say, uh, Jim, that if Washington made the playoffs – People might say the same thing. It was pretty damn remarkable that they made the playoffs. Well, damn right. Yes. yes. Especially with a rookie quarterback, a new head coach, so forth and whatnot. Andy but Isco. Let, let, yes. let, me, let me add yes, this. When I looked over the, the, the starting quarterbacks in the league and then the secondary quarterbacks 
should they go down? Because last year we had a lot of first-line quarterbacks go down and a lot of backups playing. It's very shaky when you get to the second and third string quarterbacks coming in. And that's probably going to happen because we don't have great offensive line play and these quarterbacks do get hurt. So it could. we're still going through a transition process in the NFL where we don't have a lot, a lot of depth, quality depth, at the arguably the most important position on the, on the field. It's one reason I believe the Cleveland Browns made the move they did in signing Jameis Winston yeah. as a possible backup replacement for uh, Deshaun Watson. And, you know, Winston, at least we know he has the physical tools and the skills to do that, so they were willing to pay the dollars. Andy, how do you see this division shaking out? Who do you got on top, and who do you think is going to be the most disappointing team in the NFC East? Well, Mark, I'm actually with you. I think Philadelphia is the best team. They win the division. I think they have the best balanced roster. And the offensive and defensive coordinators that they brought in have a lot of good experience from uh, what they've done elsewhere in their careers in those positions. My concern might be the uh, the uh, retirement of Kelsey, who I guess has sort of hinted that he might be available to come back, which may be saying, hey, if you guys need me over the second half of the season, I may be ready. But can they replace him you know, with all his knowledge and experience? Uh, Tony mentioned the tush push, but he's also been a leader of that offensive line. So if they can get that together, uh, th- this is the one uh, team in the in the uh, in the division that I feel comfortable playing the over the total, especially uh, considering uh, the way they started last year and then that one and six stretch. Uh, you know, it's hard to explain, but uh, teams go through it. I think based on talent, you have to like the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. And I'm also down on uh, on the Dallas Cowboys. I don't think they did much in the off season to improve. Um, I've never been overly impressed. I, I've been impressed with the talent, but I've not overly been overly impressed with what they've gotten out of the talent, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I think they did extremely well defensively with a lot of those players playing up to their potential. I can't say the same about uh, uh, the offense, and I think it's going to be a bit uh, uh, weaker the, this year, especially some of the concerns at the running back. As far as the third and uh, fourth place teams, I'm sort of against everybody or the opposite there. I like what the Giants did in the offseason. Strengthen their offensive line, strengthen their defensive line. And you go back two years, his first season, Dable, he got this team into the playoffs by winning a lot of close games and then won a convincing game against Minnesota, who was very fortunate to make the playoffs because of their great record in close games. Last year, they had a lot of injuries. Of course, Barkley was not healthy for a good part. Uh, uh, the quarterback, Jones, uh, missed significant time. It was just a, a messed up season, and I think maybe they, they were somewhat due for a regression from what they did in 2022 to 2023, and we saw that regression. I think they improve a bit this year, and I I don't know that I can say that they'll uh, battle Dallas for second, but I wouldn't be surprised if the gap between Dallas and the Giants is less this year than it was last year. I'm more optimistic than pessimistic on Washington. I do like a lot of things that happened, but I wonder if too much happened. New ownership, new staff, new quarterback, new coach. Everyone who likes Washington or most people who like Washington can point to what the Texans did last year. But as has been remarked, what the Texans did last year is a very infrequent occurrence. And that doesn't mean it can't happen in back-to-back seasons. You know, like the uh, Texans, they have a defensive-minded head coach in Dan Quinn. Uh, like the Texans, they're going to have a, a, a rookie quarterback uh, take charge. And uh, maybe somewhat like the Texans, they play in a division that maybe is slightly better than what uh, the Houston Texans were in last year, because I think Philadelphia at the top is better than, say, a Jacksonville or an Indianapolis. Uh, I, I haven't decided on what I'm going to do as far as season totals go with Washington, but I'm more inclined to look over the six and a half than under. Well, Andy likes Washington, as do many people on the panel here, uh, looking for the Philadelphia Eagles to win this division. Greg De Palma, our producer from Prime Sports Network, how do you see this division shaking out this year? Yeah, I agree with uh, the sentiment on Washington. I, I think the question is going to be, Washington or the Giants, and, and I say that even though I understand the Giants have some issues, no question. Uh, the offensive line is the biggest issue. Um, but they were a playoff team. When uh, Dayball came on board, Daniel Jones was healthy. Second year, Daniel Jones gets hurt. It's just a mess. Last year was just a mess. So this year, they they bring in the, uh, Brian Burns from the trade. They have Thibodeau now, I believe, what, year three. 
Uh, they've got Dexter Lawrence, one of the most underrated players in the league. In the league, that's a lot of really good talent now that they have up front. I think that's going to help them. So I don't know. It's but the reason I bring that up is is because I do think someone's going to surprise. I think it's going to and, and not just a wild card. I think it's going to be either Washington or the Giants because the Cowboys are vulnerable, as we all know. C.D. Lamb, he hasn't reported yet. Dak Prescott kind of knows in the back of his mind that he may not be here. I mean, I think those chances look pretty good that Dak Prescott's not going to get the contract that he wants from Dallas. So I think that's a lot. And again, as Vic pointed out at the very start of it, I mean, have they really even had an offseason? They, they haven't done anything. So that's that's got to be bad news. Mike Zimmer takes over at defensive coordinator. By the way, every team in the NFC East has a new defensive coordinator. So that's kind of interesting. Huh. Um, Interesting, yeah. Yeah. Very. So, and then you also have the fact that I don't believe that just bringing in two experienced coordinators is going to make everything okay in Philly. It might, but I don't know. I think that they're vulnerable. So I think the Cowboys are vulnerable, the Eagles are vulnerable, meaning maybe Washington or the Giants will be the surprise team. Let's move over now to the NFC North division. Uh, Greg, I'm going to ask you to start the clock in this division. I know we ran over a little bit in the NFC East. And I'll start things off with the North once again, as we usually do. And the team I'm going to pick to win the North is going to be a bit of a surprise. I don't think this is going to be like Philadelphia and everybody uh, unanimously getting to this particular football team because it would be a surprise. It'd probably be a surprise, maybe even in the sense of the Washington Commanders winning their division. But I'm going to run with the Chicago Bears this football season here. And um, it's a football team that uh, even before they drafted Caleb Williams, I like the way that they they tended to business last year the way they've closed out the football season they started out three and eight on the year and they went up four and two out on the season here their offense and their defense improved on both sides of the football 15 yards and 53 yards respectively on each side of the football and uh, thanks to that five and three finish they had last year they were three and 14 the first year and they moved to seven and ten the second year under matt eberflus their second year head coach now they've got caleb williams and they've got a wide receiver in Romy Adunze. They were first round picks in a draft that our lads and pro football focus had rated A plus draft for the Chicago Bears this football season. Also, if you look at their record body of work last year, uh, look, look at the, some of the teams they played last year and who they're gonna play this year. It's a much more fortuitous schedule for the Chicago Bears this year, who I think will have their first winning season in 11 years this football season here. I think uh, there's a lot of good things going on in Chicago. Most disappointing team in the division here? I know I could need jerk and go to Detroit for all the reasons I spoke of before because they are going to regress. Guys, they are going to regress. I know <laughs> the public loves them, the world loves them, but it's going to happen. Uh, my most disappointing team is gonna be the Green Bay Packers in this division this year. And this is a team that last year, their season win total this year is 10. Last year it was seven and a half. It's been adjusted two and a half games based on what they did last football season. So now to use that famous phrase, they go from the hunted to the hunter this year after winning the division or having that good season, Detroit won the division. I also see a sophomore bounce in effect here for Jordan Love now that they finally have game film on him for all football season long. And here's a team in Green Bay that took on eight teams with a winning record last year. They're going to face 11 teams, at least what they did last year, that are going to have a winning record. Put me down for Green Bay as being disappointing this football season. And with that, turn it over to Victor King. Victor, how do you see the NFC North shaping up this year? Well, you'll see here Detroit 12-5 and five in the regular season. A little bit of a letdown, definitely expected. Green Bay 9-8, and eight, uh, Minnesota, Chicago both went seven and ten straight up if i can throw in my little bit of uh over under angle obviously when detroit is playing at home indoors we always look to go over the total they went six and two to the over in their home games last year 51.0 combined points per game and in fact one of the best home over teams of the last four seasons in fact Detroit home games uh, since now 2019 have gone 22 and 11, 67% over the total, 54.8 points per game. Again, Detroit, and I'll have something to say about their indoor games. We always look to go over the total. Uh, Green Bay was an interesting team in their road and home splits last year. 
in regards to over-under results. Only 39.4 combined points per game at home last year, but 46.4 on the road. They went 7-2 and two to the over. Their road games averaged 7 points per game more than their home games last year. Uh, not much in the area of both Minnesota and Chicago. Uh, Minnesota 3-5 and five over under at home, 4-5 and five on the road. Both teams somewhere in the neighborhood of 42 to 44 combined points per game. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to load up on the Lions to once again repeat as uh, champions of the NFC North. And guys, in their 17-game schedule, and Mark touched on this in our yearbook magazine, only three total outdoor games for the Lions on this year's schedule. 14 indoor games, only three outdoor games. Last year, they had their best offense in the last six seasons, 394 yards per game, 27 points per game, and their best defense in the last nine years as well. And this was an area in which they addressed with the draft in the offseason. For me, the clincher, Detroit does very well against winning teams. In fact, in the last three years, against greater than 500 opponents, the Lions have gone 14-2-1 ATS. They usually save their best for when they are playing winning teams. I think they repeat as champion. Uh, most disappointing team, this is a pretty good day uh, for us to all pile on the Minnesota <laughs> Vikings. And I say that because earlier this morning it was announced rookie first-round quarterback J.J. McCarthy now out for the year. It's going to be Sam Darnold for the whole season in Minnesota. Uh, not only that, but uh, I just found out about an hour ago that an impactful offensive player was injured today and taken off the field in the cart. That would be second-year wide receiver Jordan Addison. What is going on in Minnesota this offseason? It, oh it just God. happened wow. about an hour ago. So wow. uh, we're going to be piling on the Vikings probably. Wow. And with injuries at that position last year, they had their worst offensive year since 2019. They're being compared with the Dallas Cowboys as far as the least improved team in the entire league. And that's what you're going to get when you lose a signal caller who had a 12-year quarterback rating of 98.2 in Kirk Cousins. And you got to play the guy with the worst ATS record for quarterback since the 2018 season, Sam Darnold, 22-33-1 ATS. I think there are multiple guys here in the panel are going to be piling on Minnesota for disappointing <laughs> team this year. Well, let me ask uh, Jim Feist this question now. If Minnesota is wrecked with all these injuries, as Victor's uh, reporting here, uh, does it set up the possibility of a Justin Jefferson trade somewhere along the time line down the season here? Because I can't see Justin Jefferson playing on a stone cold last place football team. Can you? Well, um, it depends on how forward thinking this team is. If they're not going to do anything positive this year with that talent on the team, they might as well try to build something the future by picking up uh, other players and draft choices from someone that would need a court a, a wide receiver and he's one of the best if not the best and yeah i'd make that kind of a move because you have a, a brand new head coach um who's i happen to like but uh, with the quarterback situation they have and the injuries that they're piling up this i, I hate to say it even the season hasn't even started but this might be one of those seasons where you're rebuilding and you say, okay, this season's gone. We're going to build for next year. And, and Jefferson is a guy we can uh, pick up some chips for. And uh, let's go get him. Well, the problem is uh, he just signed a new contract. Right. And the dead, the dead money is just ridiculous. So, I mean, you're talking about something along the lines of, let's Deshaun see. Deshaun Watson. <laughs> $120 million for the next two years. So he's not going anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, well, you, you take, a, take a look at what Russell Wilson, how much is Denver play, paying him this year versus what Pittsburgh paying him? Well, those I mean, sometimes got, you just sometimes you just want to get rid of somebody. Well, that's the thing. Sometimes you want to get rid of someone. I don't think they want right. to just get rid of Justin <laughs> Jefferson. 
And we don't know how Sam Darnold will perform. I mean, he's he might do well at times yeah. that he's a capable quarterback. And now that he knows he's the starter and they're building an offense around him as the number one guy, he might surprise. Although, to be fair, it is a tough division. And really, this I've never seen. I don't know if you guys ever remembered, starting with their draft pick who died. Do you remember an offseason that an NFL team has experienced something like this before? Seriously, from a, your draft pick dying, your first round draft pick is out for the year. Uh, they've had three or four other serious injuries in the first. They've had at least five. Right, T.J. Hawkinson's out for half the year. Right. I mean, it's just. Well, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's just they're, they're, in that respect, they are done. I mean, before they even started. That, well, Jim, uh, Jim and Andy, I'm gonna Jim and Andy, I'm gonna circle back to you guys for your review of this particular division. I'm gonna hand it over to Tony Mejia, and find out what Tony thinks about uh, number one the division and number two about what's going on in Minnesota. Well, I'll, I'll start with the Minnesota thing first because, it, according to Kevin O'Connor, uh, it's not serious the Jordan Addison thing, so that's great. Um, but he was carted off like less than an hour ago. It's just an ankle thing. And look, I mean, we're, we're seeing these things pop up uh, throughout the league. Malik Neighbors over the weekend, it looked like he had done something to his ankle. I, I looked at it because um, somebody tweeted footage of uh, one of the giant beat writers, and it looked bad and ended up being just, you know, something that thankfully is going to be good. Same thing with Terry, their, their rookie running back that everybody expects a lot from uh, Tracy, I'm sure uh, I should say Tyrone right, Tracy. Right, Tracy yeah. uh, and he, he's going to be fine. So, I mean, hopefully the Addison thing is fine. He was a knucklehead over the over the summer getting, uh, what was it, LAX <laughs> or Vegas. One of the airports, he ended up falling asleep behind a Rolls Royce. So, clearly not great decision-making <laughs> for, uh, for Mr. Addison, but thankfully he's he's fine. And, I mean, I think Sam Darnold was going to beat out McCarthy anyway, so uh, we shall see what happens with these Vikings. But they, they certainly um, picked a tough year to have all of this happen considering the rest of the division is a lot better. I do think, disappointment-wise, I'll ride with the Lions, just because I don't believe that they'll have as good a year as they had last year. Uh, also, uh, just to correct myself, I said Matthews. I, I don't know why I thought Jake Matthews. I was uh, referring to Lane Johnson earlier with the Eagles. Uh, and as far as the uh, winner of this division, I like Green Bay. I think um, they get rid of Joe Barry. He ends up in Miami. Uh, and so uh, Jeff Halfley, coached uh, Boston College for a while, uh, is now their defensive coordinator. They've got a lot of talent on that side of the ball. Uh, and Jordan Love, I think he his process, both maturation-wise and talent, over the last half of last season and getting that experience uh, to where they competed in the NFC playoffs, I test-wise, they were as good as all of the teams uh, that ended up uh, advancing in the NFC championship game in, in uh, Detroit and San Francisco. Uh, I thought Jordan Love made such significant strides with a receiving core that had major injuries. So if you keep those guys healthy, everybody's raving about Dontavian Wicks of this offseason as potentially being a number one. You've got Jaden Reed. All these guys are really young. Um, you know, and, and you've got uh, Christian Watson, who when he was out there was a productive deep very much. ball receiver. I mean, extremely so. So... I think if you have all those guys continue to take a step forward uh, and you get to, uh, I, and I think I mentioned this last week, you get to late November, December, the difference for me between the Packers and the Lions is the fact that the Packers can have the elements work for them where Detroit playing in a dome uh, doesn't have that luxury. So uh, give me the Packers to win the division. I think it's going to be competitive. I think Chicago is going to be a lot better. I think Minnesota is going to be uh, not as, as so long as Jefferson stays healthy and Darnold isn't a disaster. I think they'll be competitive, which uh, puts D Detroit uh, in a tough situation, not being the hunted in this division. And so uh, a really even division that Green Bay ultimately wins for me. Andy Isco, how do you see the North working this way out this football season? Well, I'll, I'll work backwards. I'll, I'll agree with the panel as far as Minnesota goes. I mentioned earlier about their great season in 2022 when they uh, ended up going 13-4, uh, and four, winning all those close, uh, uh, close games. Well, they felt at 7-10 and 10 last year, but if you go before the 13-5, and five, they were just a very mediocre f football team, 8-9 and nine in 2021, 7-9 and nine in 2020. 
the last year of the 16 game schedule. So you can really see that uh, uh, 2022 was an outlier, basically based upon the improvement that they showed in win losses and the way that they showed it. And they reverted back to somewhat of what they had been uh, as a with their seven and 10 uh, record last year. Now, of course, all the developments off season where they didn't do much and uh, or they didn't have good fortune uh, with uh, with what happened with those top draft choices and uh, uh, the other factors around that I mentioned, Sam Darnold could be the difference. I still think they're the fourth best team in the division. I'm going to go with uh, the third place team as being the uh, Chicago Bears. I know there's a lot of enthusiasm, and I've mentioned, I think it probably has been every week. I, I would not have gotten rid of Justin Fields. He had shown improvement, and so had the Bears in the uh, three seasons. They uh, uh, were 6 and 9, 6 and 11, rather, in uh, 2021. 3 and 13, they fell off in 2022, and they improved by four games, 7 and 10 last year. So they were showing improvement, and I felt that they held on to Justin Fields, especially with his ability as a quarterback. Uh, they could improve upon this year because very likely they could have gotten Marvin Harrison, Marvin Harrison Jr. in the draft. Now, they do have some good wide receivers for uh, Caleb Williams, but think of the experience that they're giving up by starting over at the quarterback position. You know, they go from uh, Mitch Trubisky to Justin Fields. Uh, Trubisky was a failure. I'm not going to say Justin Fields was, uh, but now they're starting over and they could have improved themselves a little bit more uh, had they held on to him. So I think it may be a little bit of a struggle in the first year as they are essentially retooling because of the quarterback position, despite the fact he'll be surrounded by some good weapons. As far as Green Bay and Detroit goes, uh, I know, Mark, you were down on Detroit last year because uh, in 2022, their nine wins uh, more than exceeded the wins in the previous two seasons. And so there was reason to expect a regression. And yet what happened? They turned that nine and eight into a, um, a 12 and five uh, regular season. And then they had uh, uh, some nice uh, that nice playoff uh, uh, win. Um, I'm sorry, the, the playoff loss at uh, uh, San Francisco uh, that uh, ended their season. But this is a team that I think has an ability. I don't know that they'll have the same record that they did last year, but I do think they are a double digit win team, which, mean, which means 10 and seven or better. But I'm going to go with the Green Bay Packers and I'm going to make the comparison to somewhat what the Detroit Lions did only with a little bit of a twist. When um, uh, the coach uh, Campbell came in for um, Dan Campbell came in for Detroit. I think it was his first or second year. They started 0-10 and one, and then had a nice finish down the stretch, going I believe it was three and three. In the following year, they had a breakout season by they were 3-13 and one that year. They went nine and eight in 2022, including a win at the end of the year that knocked Green Bay out of the playoffs by winning that Sunday night game. And then of course we saw what they did last year. Well, you look at Green Bay, uh, somewhat of a different pattern, but still they struggled uh, throughout the uh, 2022 season. <clears throat> Uh, but they played well very late, building some momentum for what we saw last year, the first year without Aaron Rodgers uh, as the uh, known starter. And uh, despite that start, they had a very strong finish, building the momentum for 2024, much in the way that the Lions built their momentum for 2023 by their finish in 2022. The difference is, you go back last year, the uh, Packers were, uh, uh, what were they? Uh, uh, the record, I think, was uh, nine and... Um, nine and eight, I think, coming into the playoffs. And then they had that impressive playoff win at Dallas and nearly knocked San Francisco out of the uh, Super Bowl with uh, uh, that, AF, that NFC Championship game. They were eight and nine the year before in 2022 before they had that nice second half stretch. However, the years before that, including playoffs, 13 and five and 14 and four. So the Green Bay Packers actually had a very good team and the outlier, much like Minnesota's offensive and, and their record in 2022 was an outlier, so was Green Bay's uh, performance in 2022 uh, when they uh, had uh, that uh, the, the last year of Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love facing all the pressure to, fa to uh, face two Hall of Famers, replaced Brett Favre and uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, had a very strong season, especially the second half, and then throughout the playoffs uh, had, some, had some good things happen. I think Green Bay wins the division, and I played them over their uh, 10 wins this season. Andy likes the Green Bay Packers, as do other people on the panel. Uh, other than yours truly. And with that, Jim Feist, uh, very quickly, uh, because we're going to get to our final segment here, who do you like to win this division and who do you think is the most disappointing team? Well, I'm, I have to throw Minnesota under the bus just because of the other situation. you got three other quality teams that are – this is an exciting division as opposed – when I look at the NFC East, I look for teams that are getting older. They got, I'm not excited about that. Something good will come out of it. Someone will win it. 
but this is an exciting division where there's three teams you mentioned in Chicago, Lions, Packers. They're all there. I mean, any one of these teams, given a little bit of luck injury-wise and, and some close wins, any of them would win. I'm going to go with the Lions. I think Goff um, has had some big game experience. He's been to the Super Bowl already. He lost uh, when he was with McVay. Um, then he's played very well under under Campbell. Campbell, the players like playing for Campbell. I mean, he came. He was going to break your knees and everything else when he came in. But you know, <laughs> I give him credit. He makes some crazy decisions in game, but it's worked for him. I can't knock anything about the coach at, at Green Bay. Uh, Love has got less experience at, as a starter. But, um, and, and I know that somebody said about the, the elements helping Green Bay. Well, the elements help Green Bay because they play in terrible weather and other teams, especially an indoor team playing outdoors might have some trouble. But as Victor mentioned before, 14 of the 17 regular season games, Detroit's indoors and damn it, they know how to play indoors. They're good. So I'm, I'm going with Goff. Campbell. Last year, and the higher experience level of that team versus Green Bay, who's just recently put together, and the half season by Love and a couple of good games in the playoffs was very impressive. I like that. And Caleb Williams for the Bears, I think just needs a little bit more seasoning. This is a tough division. There's going to be a lot of learning curve for him. He's still a young man with a tremendous upside, no question about it. He could be the next superstar. He could be, he could be the – this could be the Dallas uh, – the Houston Texans because if he can play like – he looks like he can play. But this is a tough division, I think. I think it's going to go Lions, Packers, Bears, Minnesota. One, two, three, four, says Jim Feist. Detroit Lions leading the way in the pack. Greg De Palma will wrap up this segment with your take on the NFC North. Yeah, I think everybody has uh, said – Really, all I don't know how much more I could add, uh, to, uh, other than just to say, sort of like what Jim said, is I'm leaning towards Detroit over Green Bay just a little bit. Uh, what, what I do think might change my mind is how what kind of a start does Green Bay get off to? Because they ended so strong, and they look so good, and probably should have beat San Francisco. So can they pick up where they left off? And as Andy said, they've got to keep those receivers healthy. So th- there's a lot to like there. But Detroit's a little bit more stable right now. So that's why I agree with Jim that it's just Detroit, Green Bay. It can go either way. So um, those two teams, though, I think are, are definitely headed. Who knows? Maybe they play in the championship game of the conference. Uh, and uh, and in the Bears, yes, I, I agree with uh, what Mark said about uh, how well they played at the end of the year. Um, but rookie quarterback combined with a suspect offensive line is not a good remedy, especially when Caleb Williams, that's one knock on him, is how does he, because he hasn't had the opportunity too often to be uh, dealing with heavy pressure in college. But when he did, he was a wild card. So I think that's going to be something he's going to have a lot of growing pains. And how does he handle those growing pains is going to be the interesting thing because we don't know if he's got that mental ability yet. Uh, to be able to withstand that in a big city like Chicago. So that's going to be the big story, of course. Greg agrees with most of the experts panel and also the Chicago Bears maybe to be improved, but not to be a contender this football season here. And guys, we're going to close this out with our final segment of the show, what we promised you at the very beginning. We call it our NFL Top 100. And once again, this is being brought to you by PlaybookSports.com, where you can download the Playbook football newsletter for the preseason right now or get your copy of the playbook football preview guide magazine at playbooksports.com and with that i'm going to hand it over to greg de palma our producer it was greg's idea to do this segment here to check in with each of our panelists on their take and opinion on the nfl top 100 players in the league this year all right so what we're going to do is is uh, we're going to again this is the top 100 from the players it came out a couple of weeks ago and all we're going to do is is we're going to we have some questions that we're going to ask our panel uh regarding who they believe were overrated in this uh in this uh, in this uh, poll if you want to call it underrated and a few other things we're going to start with andy andy i believe you have what 15 minutes left andy might be on mute okay yeah, and if I can get the mouth down there in time, I can unmute and I say the answer, yes. Okay. So, now it's 14 minutes, 30 seconds. Okay, there you go. I wasted that time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me start the timer, too, while, while I'm at it. 
and there we go. Okay, so uh, let's start with Andy. Uh, taking a look at your list, uh, Lamar Jackson is a player that you believe was rated a little high. He's second overall. In other words, the players believe Lamar Jackson is the second best player in the NFL. You believe that that is a wrong assessment. So how far would you drop Jackson, and where do you rate him overall as far as the top quarterbacks? Well, it's sort of a combination of overrated and underrated, and I rated Lamar Jackson number uh, one of the overrated players uh, was because he wasn't uh, because he's the number one quarterback, and I think that really you have to consider uh, that doesn't mean he's underrated overall, just where he was in position. And I did it relative to the other quarterbacks in there. I think you have to rate Patrick Mahomes as the top quarterback if you're looking at players based upon what he has accomplished uh, throughout his brief career. I mean, where he's he is on an arc to uh, do what the Tom Brady did with uh, with the Patriots, with what he's accomplished in his first uh, five, six seasons as far as Super Bowls, playoffs, and his clutch performance, playing through injuries late in games, etc. So that was the reasoning behind having uh, Mahomes underrated, uh, over yeah underrated, and Lamar Jackson uh, overrated. And again, I take a look at some of the other quarterbacks on the uh, on, on the list. And uh, in fact, I'll just go ahead and say that the uh, the other the other three uh, overrated players uh, that I had were basically uh, the quarterbacks. I thought Dak Prescott was rated a bit too high, and Brock Purdy was rated a bit too high. Uh, Prescott, of course, you have to consider the totality of it as well as the potential. And Dak Prescott has had numerous opportunities to win big games for the Cowboys, and he has not. And, of course, that's also part of Lamar Jackson, his inability to win those playoff games when that was a time to prove himself uh, despite what he's done in the regular season. Great quarterbacks, both of them, but I think a little bit over overrated compared to some of the other, other quarterbacks that are uh, rated behind them on this list. Guys like, uh, I think, Burrow is, is lower. I think Herbert is lower. Again, they haven't had the, quite the same playoff successes, for example, uh, of Mahomes, but I think they're a little bit better overall as far as their potential goes and what they've been able to accomplish uh, than uh, uh, than where they, uh, they are listed. Uh, the other one um, that I mentioned... Uh, Purdy, he's only really had, he had the great finish when he came in in the middle of 2022, and then, of course, what he did last year, but I don't think he's been in the league long enough to be uh, rated ahead of guys like Burrow or, uh, uh, or, or uh, for, uh, uh, for San Diego the uh, quarterback there. Justin uh, Herbert, yeah. Yeah, I'm sort of just skipping things around here, so I'm looking at it. Uh, but I do th I think he has the potential to move up. But he also had, perhaps, with Purdy, with San Francisco, he may have had the best surrounding talent, especially in skill, pos skill positions, than some of the other quarterbacks on the list who are rated uh, perhaps a bit ahead of him, but also a bit behind him as well. So, all right, so let's go back to the question. Where would you put Lamar Jackson, rating him as far as overall quarterbacks? Is he number two? I might put him number three because I still like Jalen Hurts and what he can do for uh, for the Eagles and his versatility. We'll see wow. what happens with the offensive line this year. Uh, I do like Lamar Jackson, but again, it's hard to ignore what he did, uh, what he's done in the playoffs with several opportunities. Uh, now, we do have injury concerns with Burrow, but I like what he's been able to do, and I wonder what he'll be able to. It's interesting, you know, Circa puts up uh, betting odds for Super Bowl exactus. They've done it the last few years. Last year, I played several combinations, one of which was Chiefs over Niners, and the other was Niners over Chiefs, among others. My first look this year, actually, was Bengals over Lions and Lions over Bengals. And, of course, it assumes that both teams are healthy and get there. And the odds on both of those combinations are 115 to 1. So I think that uh, part of the reason those odds are that long is because of the fact that we don't know if Burrow can play a complete season uh, based on his, uh, on his history. But uh, I would uh, put Lamar Jackson probably, uh, let's see, if I put Mahomes 1, Burrow 2, uh, Hurts 3, I'd pr probably put Lamar Jackson fourth, but no lower. All right. Oh, amongst quarterbacks. That's amongst quarterbacks. Quarterbacks. The list yep. we're talking about is all Just players. quarterbacks. That's all. Yeah. Uh, Andy, uh, you can stick with us for the next five or ten minutes, or if you want to leave early, sure. it's up to you. Um, I'll stick around. Let's continue. Because I still have my two. Uh, I still have two of my three underrated players. Well, hey, let's uh, let's hear uh, those, Andy. Who are your them. underrated players? Yeah, might as well do yeah, it okay. now, Andy. Okay. Um, I did go with a member of the Dallas Cowboys, and he is highly rated, but perhaps when I look at the entire list, 
Micah Parsons. I think he's one of the few defensive players that that opposition teams uh, have to prepare for every week because he can be dominant at times. He can do a number of different things, and I know he's rated highly on the uh, on the list. In fact, it was a it was almost a toss of where I rated him and uh, Miles Garrett of the Browns because I think both of those are outstanding players, and I I would have rated those two a lot closer. But again, we're talking about. Uh, the the all the defensive players or especially the uh, the linebackers and defensive linemen uh, I would have uh, put uh, uh, Micah Parsons up a little bit more with the wide receiver I went with Debo Samuel although I came very close from saying uh, Jamar Chase with Cincinnati because I think both of those guys are outstanding wide receivers uh, and of course uh, they actually go with two of the quarterbacks that I said were rated too high uh, that well one of the quarterbacks Das uh, uh, not Trescott. Um, uh, with uh, Jamar Chase Burrow, one of the ones I thought could have been rated higher, but because of the injuries weren't. And, of course, uh, Brock Purdy, one of the ones I did think was rated too high because, again, I mentioned the surrounding t- uh, talent. So Debo Samuels, I think, adds the dimension of his ability out of the backfield. He'll average uh, two, three, four rushes per game, but throughout his career, he's averaging like six or seven yards per carry, which uh, makes me think that he could be used even more, especially when it comes to spelling uh, Christian McCaffrey, who's highly rated, and I understand he's pretty close to where he should be. Uh, But I think Devo Samuel's versatility suggests that I might have rated him a bit higher than, uh, than the NFL players did. All right. Well, let's uh, stick up on uh, that quarterback situation because this is really the biggest uh, part of the whole ranking conversation. Right. Yeah. Because to tell you the truth, I don't know about you guys, but it's it gets annoying when uh, a football player or any athlete will 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 say, especially if they become a broadcaster, will say that he doesn't value anyone's opinion who's never played the game. And I always, of course, think that's hilarious, especially when you take a look at players uh, and and their psyche and how much intelligence they have. In, in, I mean, just take a look last week, last year in the Super Bowl with um, the wide receiver uh, Hardman, who scores a touchdown in the Super Bowl and didn't realize the game was over. I mean, come on, dude. If you didn't know the game was over, I mean, okay, you can catch the ball, but yeah, okay, you know more than we do about football just because you play the game. So anyway, the reason I bring this up is this poll. I mean, the fact that these players believe that Tyree Kill is the best player or the most important player in the NFL, I mean, what does that say? So let's talk about this. I'm going to start with you, Jim. I want you to compare Lamar Jackson to Patrick Mahomes because I think this is a simple comparison, and but there's a, everybody has their own opinion of why they believe Patrick Mahomes is a better player quarterback than Lamar Jackson. Are you mute, Jim? I, I thought the players had it the other way around. Don't they have Lamar Jackson rated ahead of Mahomes on that list? Yeah, they got Mahomes, uh, Jackson 2, and Mahomes Yeah, Jackson uh, 2, Mahomes four. 4. Yeah. I can't hear Jim. Can you no, guys? No, I cannot either. No, I can't I cannot. hear either. Jim, we can't hear you. Oh, that's not good. He's gonna. I think he's gonna sign back in. All right. All right. So let's, uh, Victor. Why don't you go ahead and start this uh, conversation off? Because uh, this is definitely one of the players that you pointed out that you thought was uh, a little bit underrated. But sure. by the way, let me beg out right now because it's almost a 15 minutes, and uh, I'd like for you guys to be able to go uninterrupted the rest of the way and some, give me something to listen to tonight. All right. Hey, good, Andy. Have a great week. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Andy. Take care. Thanks, guys. Take care, Andy. Guys, uh, let's not miss words. This, there's a lot of politics involved in this vote. There are multiple aspects and elements of uh, ego and respect and even a little bit of resentment when fellow players are voting for the top 100. Uh, we're going to talk about Mahomes. We're going to talk about Lamar Jackson. Again, Lamar, what have you done in the playoffs? That's, that's that's number one for you to deserve the number two overall ranking and the number one quarterback ranking. This is the first time in 13 years that a wide receiver uh, took the top spot in the player rankings. And it comes at this uh, new time here in the NFL where wide receivers are valued as high as they ever have been. And some will even say too high. Not only is this the first year that a wide receiver, Tyreek Hill, topped 
the chart, but 20 receivers cracked the top 100, tied for the most ever. And again, it feels like some sort of an overcorrection by the voters, by the players. Hill being crowned number one in this year of all years feels especially whacked to me. Yeah, we we love him down here in South Florida, and he's starting to set receiving records down here. But the Dolphins are still a team that continues to struggle to get out of the wild card round. And meanwhile, you got your Patrick Mahomes, already a surefire Hall of Famer and the top-ranked player from last year, drops three spots to number four after leading basically a ragtag group group of wide receivers to a come-from-behind win in the Super Bowl. I don't see it. I don't like the fact that Tyreek's number one and Patrick Mahomes by far should be number one on this list. So where would you put Lamar Jackson, Victor? Uh, I would put Lamar somewhere in the area of second or third quarterback. Um, I do not. Let me see here. I've got my list here. And uh, I might even make him third because I like Josh Allen as the number two quarterback. So I could see Lamar fitting into that number three slot just ahead of Jalen Hurts behind both Patrick Holmes and Josh Allen. Yeah, that's actually – I agree. I think Josh Allen is the second quarterback on my list too. Um, Mark, uh, you – Andy talked about Burrow being his second favorite quarterback right behind Mahomes. What do you think? Because Burrow – I mean, wow. Talk about being underrated. I know he was injured last year, but I'm not sure why that should be the reason why he's almost out of the top 50 altogether. Well, you know, it's my feeling, Greg, that this is a list of talent, not a list of uh, uh, injured players or you know, what to what degree of an injury yeah. do they have. It's talent. Yeah. It's, what, it's what it's all being based on. And I've got him amongst my top three underrated players on this list. He comes in at number uh, 49 as a quarterback. I think that's ridiculous, uh, <laughs> Joe Burrow. Ridiculous. I think he's the number three quarterback in the league. So I have to make him uh, obviously an underrated quarterback in this league. And uh, if I can continue with this same thing without you asking me another question, I'm going to tell you who my most underrated player uh, is uh, in amongst this top 100. And it's a player who's not even on the list, uh, who I think is head and shoulders bar none, the best running back in the National Football League. And that's Nick Chubb, the Cleveland Browns. Uh, He's not on the list because he suffered that injury last year and missed most of the football season. When Nick Chubb is healthy, he's dominant. He's not just good. He is dominant. He's the reason the Cleveland Browns made the playoffs or make the playoffs. He's the reason the Cleveland Browns are uh, a double-digit win total to win the, on the football season this year. I think Nick Chubb absolutely deserves a spot on this top 100 list, and I think it was a, a, a sham that he wasn't even mentioned in amongst the other uh, people. The other underrated player that I have has to be Patrick Mahomes. I agree 100% with Victor. He is the best quarterback in the National Football League and I think arguably the best player in the National Football League. Why do you think Tony, why do you think that is uh with Mahomes? Do you because uh it, it, as Victor said, is it politics? Is it well we like Lamar Jackson, we don't like Patrick Mahomes? I mean usually there's a ton of respect that goes to play quarterbacks especially in the NFL that have won three Super Bowls in such a short period of time. Yeah, I mean, I have no idea because you're asking a subjective opinion of all of us based on a subjective opinion of people that are asked <laughs> for their opinion. And then therefore, I mean, look, I've seen a GM survey, an NBA GM survey. I've seen the questions that are asked. I have no idea how this was phrased. You know, list list the best players, list who you fear the most, list who you have to game plan most for. This is players, not coaches. Um, the, the way that I understand NFL players handle uh, their their game preparation is viewing the people that they're lining up against. So, you know, that probably takes into account quarterbacks 100% of the time, but not necessarily linebackers really keying in on, on wide receivers. They're probably looking at running back and tight ends more. Uh, D-backs are looking at wide receivers probably 
a little more than they're studying running backs. So it all is extremely subjective to me. I think it's hilarious that Lamar Jackson went from 72nd uh, one year to the second and the number one overall quarterback the next. I think that's funny. But, I mean, he had a hell of a year. I mean, he had set career highs in, in passing yards, and that was the big knock on, on Lamar is the, the best athlete playing quarterback. And can he throw? Well, he threw for nearly 3,700 yards. And that obviously was that, that was that type of growth earned him MVP. But is is he all of a sudden better than Mahomes? Obviously, I think we're all in agreement that he's not. But I mean, then, then can you say, well, Mahomes is disrespected by not being uh, put at on the pedestal as number one when he should be when he just won a second consecutive Super Bowl and is third in, in, in his short career? Uh, well, yeah, we can all say that. But I don't think he's an unlikable person. From what I from what I've seen from Patrick Mahomes, he tries to get along with anybody. He'll trash talk you, but for the most part, he's hype, trying to hype up his own team, and he's a tremendous leader. So I don't think that there's jealousy involved in this. I I think that you take this with a grain of salt. You really can't get upset about it. Uh, and from the Tyreek Hill thing, no, he's not the be- the best player in, in the NFL. Uh, but does he have an impact? that merits this to land at him at number one? Well, yeah, because his speed, like the entire Miami Dolphins offensive system is based on his speed and speed in general, but specifically his speed setting everybody else up. I mean, one of my overrated players is Raheem Mostert, who had a career year, found the end zone every five seconds, but a lot of that is tied to defenses keying on that uh, that receiving core led by Tyreek Hill. So it just is, it, you know, I, I told you this when I responded to you, I hate these lists, but I made, I made <laughs> them before. I used to make these at Sportsline way back in the day when we were trying um, to get eyeballs on the internet. And it, I remember somebody mentioning this, these are like Pringles because lists are something that you look at, you put a blurb under, and these don't even have blurbs, but as a writer, you put a blurb on them and people debate them and send them to friends and debate like this and say you're an idiot or say wow this is the best list or look at this guy he gets it he's got this guy higher than every other guy that makes these lists so i'm going to listen to him and that's how these lists are made and why they're so popular but uh this particular one is funny because of who is polled i mean you can't cast stones at the opinions because these are the players that are, are involved in these games and, and wars every week, week in and week out, and they, it's their job to study their opponents. I mean, we, I, I, you, you watch on Hard Knocks, guys uh, preparing for these, all right, we've got this week Max Crosby to deal with. Wow, let's focus in on Max Crosby and his motor. And there you go, Max Crosby's 10th overall on this list. So I, I just think that that's... You can't get too too upset about it, and you, uh, but there are things that are pretty funny or upsetting if you want to get mad about it. Like yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty crazy that uh, Lamar Jackson jumps seventy spots in in one one year to another, and that as as Mark said, Nick Chubb's not even on this list. I mean, it's completely related to injury, but it's like yeah, what have you done for me lately in terms of this this list and uh, and anything in in this type of build? Well. I mean, it, it sounds to me like the players believe that if there's if there's a game on the line, they want Lamar Jackson a quarterback, not Patrick Mahomes. It's it, it's weird to say. I, do, do they really believe this? So I mean, I don't know. You, I highly you, doubt that. I yeah, really yeah. Doubt. I mean, it, it, well, I'm going to go through my list just so, to get me out of the way, so we can be. Well, done. I want to ask you though, Tony. Again, okay. Uh, out of your out of those three, on your most underrated, okay, um, Werfs. Hunter and Baker. Who who do you think is the most underrated out of those three? Based on this number, definitely Tristan Wirfs. I think he's one of the top three offensive linemen in the league. Uh, maybe the best tackle, and I believe he just got uh, his, his he got paid. Like yeah. Um, so and to be eighty five, I mean that's wild to me. And not to mention that the reason why and props to Baker Mayfield for his breakthrough year last year, but the reason why they didn't really have a letdown from Tom Brady to Baker Mayfield was Tristan Wirfs, uh, and, and just the fact that he buys guys like Mayfield more time and really makes that offense go. My other two on, on that list were Buda Baker coming off an injury. I thought he was a little too low, but certainly I think that's why he was too low, but every year 
tackle machine, and even though he's he's a smallish safety, just such a, a wrecking crew, one man wrecking crew on that defense uh, in Arizona. And then who else did I go with? Uh, Hunter, uh, da- uh, Danielle Hunter, who uh, is now going to be with the Texans, and I think he, he's going to be uh, have a uh, huge spotlight for his his work. He's been around almost a decade now. Was great in Minnesota. Had a couple of injury uh, seasons, but I think at, at last October he was the defensive player of the year. Uh, pardon me, of the month uh, for the entire NFC. So clearly doing it still at a high level. Uh, thought he was a little too low as well. Hey Greg, let me jump in if I can. Uh, I'd like to ask Victor King a question here because I know Victor is a very, very astute fantasy football player. He knows uh, NFL fantasy as well as the back of his hand. And my question to you, Victor, is. How much in these top 100 player ratings do you think that their fantasy performance equates or relates to these rankings? Uh, I know that NFL.com, when they did it, they weren't talking about fantasy, but how much do you feel that they really relate to it? Because those are all the metrics uh, in the fantasy football world. Well, I, I, I don't think too much, Mark, because... If that were indeed the case, you'd see an overabundance of offensive skill position players on this list. And our defensive players uh, have a very, very big presence on this particular list. Uh, the, the fact that you got uh, T.J. Watt in the top 10, Max Crosby in the top 10, Fred Warner is the best linebacker. So I, I don't think that their fantasy numbers – have anything to do with the list because of the fact that defensive players are indeed getting a lot of respect on this list. Well, Christian McCaffrey carries a lot of weight in the fantasy world, and I see he wasn't rated all that high here. Uh, Do you agree with that, or is that just more for where Christian McCaffrey ranks in this list? Uh, Again, I think it's a case similar to Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes that there is a little bit of uh, resentment for some of those individual players particularly the guys, it seems, that are coming off an appearance in the Super Bowl, like the Niner players and the Kansas City players from last season. Uh, Jim, uh, you're good now with your audio? Uh, Can you hear me? There we go. Answered perfectly. All right, so tell me, why do you think Patrick Mahomes should have been rated ahead of Lamar Jackson? He's a winner. He knows how to win. Um if you know as a, as a gambler i'm gonna bet on the guy who knows how to win not the guy that produces a lot of stats and 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 then when it gets to crunch time and you you really want to i mean i there, there's people that just don't win they 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 get there they're close i, I played professional pool for a long time and I saw people that were better than me, but they couldn't beat me because I had ice in my veins and I didn't, I didn't get nervous. I just go out there and do what I was going to do, and I, I could win. Now, I wasn't the best in the world, but I was good. And I've, I've seen it in competition. People, people get a, they choke up in situations. Now, Lamar is a great athlete. I'm not can't knock the guy. He's a big, strong athlete that can do all kinds of things. He can run, he can throw, he, I mean, makes great decisions. But when Mahomes, when he's been in the Super Bowl, he's been in championship situations, he knows how to win. And uh, that might also, I mean, can, you can also put that back on the coach. I mean, Andy Reid knows how to win. I don't know. Harbaugh is a great coach as well, but how many Super Bowls has he won? How many times has he been there? I, I don't know. It's, it's. For me, Mahomes is definitely the number one guy. Are you gonna Are you gonna tell me that Lamar is better than Tom Brady? Oh, come because on he's he's more of an he's more of an athlete for sure. He's he can run better than Tom Brady, but can he win? No, I I, I think you know to me these kind of lists are made up by people that don't really know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> well, those are the players. So I agree <laughs> with you. Yeah, and but but they're players. They're good at what they do. That's not doesn't mean they're good at what we do. Absolutely. I can't play football. I mean, they kick the shit out of me. I'd be dead in a minute. But I've been, you know, Mark, I know Mark and I have been doing this for almost 60 years. So I think we're pretty good at this. 
<laughs> so. hey, hey, here's one more thing on, on this list. You're going to tell me that a football player is going to sit How is this presented to you? It's going to be slipped in, <laughs> into your locker. Hey, have this ready by this. You, you, how much time do you think that these, an effort do you think that these people are really giving to this? I'll throw down a hundred names. Well, I, I, don't let them off the hook because that, I would let them off the hook with 10, yeah, but, uh, 10 to 100. But, but not the number one guy. Everybody's everybody should just go all right. Mahomes, and the Mahomes, yeah, but the, the Mahomes, Mahomes thing is, is and, puzzling. That's the only thing I could take away from. Well, them. that's <laughs> that's the whole thing. That's that's what we're, that's the mystery, and that's now, why it's talk, weird. Talking about the wide receiver Hill. Yes, if if given the right set of circumstances with a quarterback that can throw the ball very deep, accurately, and an offensive line that can protect the quarterback long enough from get deep to throw the ball. Hill has tremendous potential to be one of the most impactful players. No, and he is, and he has been. But he did play with, with Mahomes, and he did play down in Miami with a wide-open offense. What happens if he played for somebody like the Chicago coach? They're not going to open it up like that. It's a whole different issue. These, these ratings have to do with where the hell you are, the conditions you're playing in. He plays in Miami, perfect weather. If he played in Green Bay, he wouldn't have that. So there's so many factors that go into this. It's uh, it's it's fun to talk about for some, but I, you know I just want to figure out how to win a bet. You know, guys, I think it's simple enough. Uh, one common question to ask of where these players rank among the top 100 amongst themselves is if you were starting a team today, who would be the first player you would select? <laughs> yep. Good well, point. Mine would not be Lamar Jackson. It's just that simple. <laughs> no, you're right. And and uh, the one uh, the one that I uh, that stuck out for me was and, and this just shows you, uh, Deron Bland uh, was 31 on the list, and you might say, well, that that's that's not very high. Jalen Ramsey, I believe, is the top corner at 25, and I'm okay with that because Ramsey has a, a you know a, a championship pedigree. But the fact that Deron Bland is ahead of Sauce Gardner is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the only reason Bland is even in the top hundred is because he he happened to have what six touch six interceptions and three pick sixes, something like that, which is a remarkable accomplishment for one season. But that doesn't make you a better cornerback than Sauce Gardner. It just doesn't. Not even close. But that shows you that even the players get get uh, uh, you know zeroed in on. Well, but he had those interception touchdowns. You know it, it, that should mean something. Well, yeah, but it doesn't make you the best player. So, hey Victor, let me ask you this: uh, your list of overrated players. How did you rank the overrated players from this list? Uh, uh, I, I didn't, I just basically went in the top 10 and I mentioned the fact that, uh, there's no way Hill should be number one and there's no way that Jamar Chase should be number 45. If you ask me, he's a top three receiver in this league easily. Yes. So I was a little surprised at his number 45 ranking, but as far as everything else goes, I just basically looked through the top 10. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time on this. I'm kind of like Jim. I've spent more time this week looking at week two of the NFL preseason <laughs> who I'm going to wager on. We I just want to win a bet. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so. I, I got cre- I got credit for this for this because I stopped what I was doing, did it for five minutes, and was done. But I. I <laughs> That's all I the amount of time you need time to spend on it. it. To tell you the truth. Yeah, well, absolutely, absolutely, and I. I to my own horn, six and three should be seven and two on this preseason. Good start. And hit my best bet. So yes, that is a good start. Uh, I got to get out of here because my uh, battery looks like it's going to die. So I don't want to leave abruptly. Uh, but my, just just to leave on my three overrated, uh, Puka Nakua, Brock Purdy just haven't done enough. For he most are uh, not a one year wonder because I respect his game, but uh, certainly I don't think he's one of the top running backs in the mix, and uh, he's rated like he is. So. I got to see it again from all three. But I appreciate being with you guys, and uh, I will see you again next week. All right, Tony, we'll catch you next week. Thank you so much. And, Greg, before we wrap it all up, we'd like to hear who is on your list. Uh, Who is Greg DePalma looking at from this list? I had on my list, uh, let's see, I had as my my overrated, I had Bland, 
Travis Kelsey and C.J. Stroud. Uh, Travis Kelsey did not have a good regular season last season, no. and if he was not on a playoff team, he shouldn't have even been in the top 100 last year. So, um, and so let alone top 10. Stroud, excellent rookie season, but he's not the 20th best player in the NFL. No. Just from one rookie season, it's just way overreaction. Agree. Um, the underrated would be Josh Allen, because as I agreed with Victor, I think Josh Allen is the second best quarterback in the league. So I would have put him like somewhere in the top five or six. And then two defensive backs, uh, Kyle Hamilton for the Ravens, uh, who's uh, on it is I think he's already a superstar, but uh, because he only did it in one season, it's going to take a little bit of time for him to catch up, I guess, even though I'm surprised the players had him at 43. And Antoine Winfield Jr. at 46 is another guy that's just a fantastic player. I mean, the, the stats that that kid puts up are just amazing. I, I, he's, he's, it's as good as anything that we've ever seen at the position. So there's no reason that he should be in the 40s. All right, guys, let me share with you my overrated uh, players, and then we'll put a wrap on this final show here. Uh, from the list, uh, on my overrated list, uh, top of the list was Lamar Jackson because he was ranked number two. It's purely overrated in my eyes. <laughs> uh, my second overrated player was Stefan Diggs at 56. I think he's a cancer. Uh, and he also, bottom line, he didn't play well. He just didn't Last play year, well. Right, right, right. He was dropping passes. I mean, you know, why would you have a player like this near the top 50? I don't quite get that. And number three, I'll probably get some big boos from our producer, Greg De Palma. But I have Aaron Rodgers on the list. And- <laughs> but you don't like what he did in four plays? last year mark <laughs> i wanted to see that fifth play greg okay i needed yeah, right. to see the fifth play okay. right. yeah he does, he does well in darkness retreats yes <laughs> the truth of the matter is is before this all happened his season was in total decline his numbers were the worst they've ever been and before he got traded so i don't know why all of a sudden those reverse to a 40 year old man coming off of achilles heel injury i just don't get that either i think that's name and reputation my opinion all right well by the way in the next couple of weeks our third segment uh will be more uh down our alley because this is going to be uh gambling on the season so we're going to take a look at the best props out there uh matter of fact i believe there are about uh seven that we specified we got them from DraftKings. And they're going to be actually. I, I pop it up on the list. I'm going to pop it up so everybody, uh, the viewers, can see it. So these are the seven here: MVP, Offensive and Defensive Rookie of the Year, Offensive and Defensive Player of the Year, Coach of the Year, and Comeback Player of the Year. And just taking a quick look at MVP, you see that Mahomes. Big surprise. He's the favorite. Oh wow! Yeah. Almost a five to one. C.J. Stroud is number two, at eight to one as MVP. And then all the way down the line. So this is just one of the – and each of us is going to have just one pick from each category to say this is our favorite pick. This is one we would – if we had money to gamble on, this would be the one we'd pick. So we're going to have uh, a lot of uh, interesting opinions over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I mean, it might actually just be on next week's show too because I think we're doing – I forget how our setup is. We have one more on the what? We have the South and the West next week. Yeah, we're going to do the NFC South and West, and we'll wrap the final segment up just like we did this week with that list. With this one. So, yeah, so we'll probably just do this all next week. I'd like to add add something about props. I talked to a lot of um, bookmakers, and and with DraftKings and FanDuel and these these, uh, other services that have come on board since gaming has been legalized, prop betting has taken off, and they are getting – so much call for making prop bets that we never even had available to us because we're, you know, older guys that's been around a long time to get bet sides. And for a long time, you couldn't even bet totals until they brought them on board. Right. So, so it, it now, now it's this prop betting, how many yards is they're going to get? How many interceptions they're going to throw? How many passes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing in baseball strikeouts over and above the numbers. I mean, there's so many angles but the question is, we weren't brought up with that. And A, do we know how to attack it? I'm talking to big, all of us have been around a little while, but these kids that are out there doing this, they're getting better at it because 
they're doing it every day and this is what they're brought up with. So this is a subject that bookmakers are saying to me, we, you know, they're not putting out these numbers for big money because really don't know how to make the lines that well. So they're not, because most of the bookmakers are also older. That's a, a real interesting subject. Yeah. And we'll be sure to bring that up in the final segment on next week's show. Guys, we're going to wrap it up here. I want to remind everybody that if you like what we're doing, click on the like and the subscribe buttons down below. We would really, really appreciate that. And by the way, you'll also get a free PDF version of that 2024 Playbook Football Preview Guide Magazine. If you click the like and the comment button down below, that's all you need to do along with your email address. And that's going to put the final wraps on this edition of Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. For our panel of experts, once again, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always.